Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome to this special episode of Options Insider Radio, live from Vegas. As many of you know, 2008 marks the 35th anniversary of the options market. And the options industry decided to celebrate this milestone in grand style by holding their annual conference in Las Vegas. So we thought we'd take our monthly show on the road to Las Vegas, grab as many interesting people as we could find at the conference, and sit them down in front of a microphone for a little impromptu chat. We were lucky enough to find quite a few volunteers, so over the next few weeks we're going to roll out a series of these Live from Vegas episodes. So without further ado, let's get started. Options Insider Radio. Vegas Expert Interview. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, live from Vegas. We have another guest this week who actually is an old friend of the show, Phil Gockey. What is your title these days over at the OIC? Managing Director of the Options Industry Man- Council. Managing Director. Okay, I'll have to <clears throat> make sure I note that for future reference. Now, Phil, you've been on the show before, so our our listeners are probably already familiar with you, but for the many new listeners we have, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at the OIC? I'm in charge of research and education for the institutional sector. So uh, while the OIC has traditionally had a strong presence in its website and other uh, venues for retail investors, my focus is almost entirely on the institutional sector, pension funds, hedge funds, endowments, money management firms. People everyone wants to talk about these days. It seems like the whole business is obsessed with institutions and hedge funds. So you must be a busy fellow. They have become a growing part of the business, without question. All right. The reason you're here, we want to talk about collars. So let's talk about collars. The OIC just released. Well, actually, the OIC didn't, but you, your partners released a new study based on the collars on the NASDAQ. So tell our listeners a little bit about what you guys found looking at the NASDAQ collars. I shall, but let me uh, first compliment you. I know that you've gotten some very good press recently and oh. you're uh, <laughs> i have you. to tell you that you, you, you have an invaluable much. service to uh, providing information <laughs> and i'm glad to see you got some recognition for that well, we try we try the college study that uh, university of massachusetts just released is a modified version of a normal collar a normal collar is a purchase of a one month put against a sale of a one month call while being long the underline this one is modified it's still a passive strategy so there's no market timing associated to it but it's a nine-year study that began in March of 1999 through March of 2008. And in this case, they purchased a six-month put on the NASDAQ 100 index, the power shares QQQ, and wrote consecutive one-month calls. This strategy then gives you upside potential because you're still long the underlying. It's capped where you sold the call, but you have now downside protection. And it's a pretty dramatic study. This modification, going back to nine years, has shown that by having this strategy, you would have made 150% cumulatively over the nine-year period instead of losing 12% naked long the NASDAQ. It is true that part of that reflects the crash of the technology sector in 2000 Mm to 2002. Of course. And since we are an educationally pure organization, we do the study and we promote the fact that there are sub periods. You can look at the four years from March 99 to March of 2003, where frankly the collar, that protection during the cratering of the uh, technology sector was dramatic. Yes. The collar very much outperforms being long the NASDAQ. From March of 2003 onward, you would have been better Stanford, off naked yeah. and long the, the NASDAQ, but not by that much. In the first period, you would have made 92% cumulatively over the four-year period instead of losing 50%, over 50% uh, of your assets in in the NASDAQ. In the subsequent period, you would have made 10% per annum being naked long, the collar, giving you some downside protection, you would have made 4 or 5% per annum. But in all cases, your volatility of earnings is significantly reduced by anywhere from a third to 50 percent than you would have being simply long the underlying. And it's a seminal study, we think, that will promote the concept of hedging 
to institutions that have been reticent to do so. Yes. The pension plan world is petrified of having negative publicity coming out if they are long a derivative and it goes wrong. You know, the TAB study that we still have on our website cites that many pension plans are still would prefer to lose $300 million in their portfolio than having a $2 million put expire worthless. Which is amazing. You know, it's really outrageous. Their fiduciary responsibility should be looking at ways to protect the assets. And what this study is at least going to do is open their eyes to the fact that hedging may not necessarily be a detraction from your earnings. In this particular case, it was additive. And that's a pretty powerful message that we'd like to get out. The study just came out on our website this morning. So the full study uh, done by De Sazo and Hussein uh, Kazimi from the University of Massachusetts is on the site and it's free. It'll come off in a PDF format. Or the summary with an explanation uh, on what a collar strategy is, is also on that site as of this morning. So we encourage people to look at it and come to us with any questions that you might have. It is really, as we said, we think a seminal study that will raise the consciousness of people who have been reticent to hedge. And why don't you mention the URL for our listeners so they know where they have to go? Sure. And the URL for our institutional site is optionseducation.org. And in this case, it's backslash institutional. And people are probably used to going to the 888 options. I'm sure that still works, but now you guys do have a new URL, so I wanted to put that out there. And if you only remember 888 options, it's still there. If you pull up that site, the institutional link is on the top right-hand corner. So uh, there's lots of ways to get to us, but we're all about education, and we now have a URL that says that. Now, what's interesting to me, I know when you first told us about this study last week or so, was that the crux of it seems to be a relatively simple concept, that instead of buying a short-term put and being hit by all that time decay, you just roll it out a few months, six months. And that seems such common sense to me that it's amazing it took us this long to have a study that actually verified that. Agreed. It's, uh, you know, none of these things are reinventing the wheel. By slicing and dicing, um, you can get some dramatically different payoff structures. And as you pointed out, by having a six-month put, instead of incurring the dramatic magnitude of time decay that occurs in the last few weeks of an option's life, by buying six-month options, we're only having the dramatic part of the time decay occur twice a year, Mm. while taking advantage of (laughs) writing calls each month and getting the benefit of time decay. It's the opposite there, where you want to actually collect the time decay and get the bang for your buck every month. I just got the full study in my hands yesterday, so I haven't had a chance to review the full methodology, but I'm curious. I know he tested the shorter dated puts. He tried buying, I think, one month and three months before he arrived at the six month optimal period. Did he also try the leaps as well? Did he go beyond that period or? Uh, He didn't, and that's partially because the scope was just going to get too broad with that analysis. It may be a follow-up study that the University of Massachusetts does or maybe some other institutions would take on. We also did try to focus, because I care about the institutional world, on maturities where you can legitimately argue that there's enough liquidity to handle that size. While there is a great deal of volume that trades in some of the longer-dated options, It's probably more on the call side, call writing strategy, than it is on the put side. With that minor bias, University of Massachusetts thought, well, let's focus on one, three, and six months. Arguably, if you had done longer, you'd have even different kinds of results. And this is just the first one, and it's a passive strategy. There's no market timing issues associated to it. I suspect there are going to be a number of follow-on studies. It's entirely likely that some of the broker-dealers are going to look at this and try to create customized strategies for their clients. I don't care if it's an OTC or a listed market. Yes, the Options Clearing Corporation gives you the benefit of having transparency and no counterparty risk. But even if it's an OTC product, many a times that comes back and gets hedged into the listed market. So uh, I'm agnostic about that fact, even if I think that listed markets have some benefits, in particular the last six months has shown that, you know, mark-to-market is a pretty important function. But It's uh, it's interesting that you should be agnostic on that, because I think maybe you and perhaps Scott Morris on the box, who's going to be on the show later, you two are the only ones I've heard express that fact that the OTC volume really does get hedged a lot of it back in the listed markets. I mean, you hear a lot of hemming and hawing about losing volume to the OTC market. Everyone seems so obsessed with it. It's nice to see that at least OIC and OCC aren't as worried about it. 
Well, you know, at least I'm not. And in truth, you know, when you're riding the crest of volume increases and in interest that we've had recently, it's hard to sit there and say, well, we should try to stop the innovation that occurs in a customized world. There are customers who want to do certain things. And let's be honest, the OTC market can bring up a particular product for a particular need a lot faster than you can list it and get yes. a regulatory approval. I'm not interested in stopping innovation. The listed market has its place. It has liquidity and transparency. And as long as we do that well, we'll get the benefits and have, as you know, the volume increases have been dramatic. Let's let the innovation occur wherever it needs to go. On that front, I know you speak to institutional customers quite a bit. Do you get a preference from them, whether they prefer OTC or listed, or are they pretty much agnostic? They just go wherever they can get the best product at the best price? Or I don't press either way, and I don't know that I get that much feedback. You know, I'll be honest, I think in 2006, when buy rights were very popular, initially those strategies were, were customized. Some of the new products on the CBOE and elsewhere make it a lot easier to do a listed product. We now have a benchmark. Being able to value your strategy against against some established and recognized benchmark is critical to know whether you're succeeding or not. And all those new products and new benchmarks have gone a long way to taking options from being a sort of backroom issue and bringing it to the forefront. And people are clamoring for ways to get risk reduction and reduced volatility. And I, I think all the issues have come together nicely to make our industry responsive to the needs. Now, you mentioned how your institutional market loves these passive type of products. For financial advisors, busy hedge fund managers, they don't have the time to go out there and calculate calls and write them. They can see a strategy that's put together for them like it is in the study, and then someone can go out and make a product off of it. It'll be manna for them. It will be, and, and, but it still leaves open the possibility for creative hedge fund managers and smart people to customize this in a different way, adding market timing issues. There are times when volatility or other technical measures flag market tops or bottoms, and you could clearly begin to then manipulate, are you doing in the money or out of the money calls? Obviously, the call right is a cap on your gains, and if you can manage that process with some other techniques, you might significantly increase the performance of a hedge. Yes. Remember, this is a hedge that protects you on the downside, and it's earning you money. It's additive. I forgot to mention that, actually. Both options are at-the-money options, put option and the call option. So you're writing a one-month at-the-money call, and you're buying a six-month at-the-money put. The, yeah. the summary is focused on that. Okay. The full study, the authors really did investigate the different maturities. They also investigated 5% okay. out of the money, 2% out of the money, and at the money. We really tried to simplify it and reducing it into a six-page paper. So we're focusing on, on the at the monies. And we urge you, go look at that full study because all the permutations are right. there to be evaluated and the peer review is laborious. It's there and it should be for our summary purposes, we uh, simplify. I'd imagine for the institutional market, there'd be a lot of interest, even probably more, and maybe I guess, raising the call up 3%, 5%, so they get a little of the upside, and then also having maybe a bit of a downside put. So they want to finagle that, but the core findings are what really are important to people. It feels like once you introduce a strategy that has had historical success, the permutations are infinite. No one wants to suggest that uh, they shouldn't explore the different permutations associated to it. I'm more interested in trying to continue to break down these barriers where people don't want to use derivatives and they don't want to protect themselves. We have a $2 trillion hedge fund industry that grew up almost entirely as a result that absolute return strategies were the one way that some of the really smart endowments protected themselves when the tech bubble burst. And I'll be honest, I think some of the hedge funds have not done very well in recent market experience. Some people have come up with 130-30 strategies. There you are in August of 2007, and all their shorts went up because they had already been beaten up. And all their longs went down because that was the only thing that they could sell with some reasonable efficiency. And the 130 strategies, 130-30 strategies were decimated. And many of the hedge funds that got trapped into being leveraged long fail to accomplish what their namesake suggested, hedging downside movements. This collar strategy gives you the ability to maybe create your own protective strategy. It's mark to market, it's transparent, and invites one to add something to a passive strategy to make it more uh, useful to the individual user. Coming up after the break, 
going out on the road and, and preaching the gospel of options to the institutional customers. And I'm curious how that's been going lately. When we return with Mark Longo and Phil Gaki live in Las Vegas on Options Insider Radio. Go inside the options markets with theoptionsinsider.com, where you'll find the latest industry headlines, articles from options professionals, and a discussion center where you can ask questions on a wide variety of options topics. You'll even find an audio program called Options Insider Radio that examines the hottest topics from the world of options. Best of all, there is no charge for anything on theoptionsinsider.com. Visit theoptionsinsider.com today and go inside the world of options. Options Insider Radio. Vegas Expert Interview. Continues. Let's switch gears a second to your other hat, which is going out on the road and, and preaching the gospel of options to the institutional customers. And I'm curious how that's been going lately. Uh, it's overwhelmingly strong. Um, the industry and the need for this product is growing rapidly, and it feels like you're on the crest of the wave. Your own service and its active readership and listeners is a testament to what's going on everywhere. People need information, they need education, they need ways to do things to protect themselves, and they're seeking it out. Hopefully we can provide it in a uh, proper format that assists them in that process. And it, that seems to be happening a lot. Are you seeing a particular focus or a lot of similar questions from these institutional customers about a certain area of the market or a certain strategy they really want? Or they just generally want to know more about options and they're pretty much beginners? You know, it varies pretty dramatically, but let's be honest. In 2006 and seven, because the market was trending sideways with some upward bias, getting increased yield was important. In the last nine months, getting some downside protection really became predominantly a concern. It, none of this was a total surprise to the market. The volatility indexes flagged problems nine months before the real obvious break in the market occurred. And many people were looking at broad market index puts. That's where the bulk of the, some volume increases have come from. There have been people who have gone a long way to protecting themselves. So frankly, the strategies and the desire for for education tends to be modified by market conditions. Not surprising. Tail wags the dog often. You mentioned the tab group study a little while ago. I want to go back to that for a minute. That was an interesting study in and of itself. We profiled it on our side a while ago, and there are a number of interesting takeaways that we saw from that, and I'm curious you know, what you thought were some of the highlights of that study that you think would be particularly relevant to our listeners here today. Just the title, I think, is uh, <laughs> commanding, and we can only describe it over the radio, but the front picture is fascinating. It's a picture, I believe, of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and the title is Rising Out of the Obscurity, and it does really put a light on how the options product has come out of the shadows and gone into an area where it has become accepted and people are anxious to promote it. The study focuses a lot on not only the pension plan need for education, but it then focuses a lot on the institutional users, the institutional users being defined here more like hedge funds and the investment banks that service them. The industry has a lot of issues to deal with, from penny pricing to dollar strikes, which is more important. I thought it was interesting, you know, that discussion occurred today yes. with many of the panelists. And, you know, the TAB group is reflecting on, as pennies become more frequently used in individual series, what happens to the visible liquidity, how do institutions get their executions, Surprisingly, their findings found that many of those institutions still use voice brokers to get assistance to do executions, which is kind of fascinating. The, uh, that the really surprised me how prominent that still is. It is. When you think that mom and pop retail, the growth of that product on the retail side was very much electronically driven, where you could see what you were going to execute. You got a point and click capability, and it kind of points up that you needed the retail side and the exchanges to become more driven by technology to make a liquid market. And once you had enough critical mass generated in large part by those small retail orders, now you've made it possible for institutions to consider the product, to consider leaving the OTC world where they didn't get transparency and moving into the listed world. And it's a fascinating transition. The TAB group did a good job in pointing out where we've been. And the fact is, that we're probably, using the baseball analogy, we're not in the seventh, eighth, or ninth inning. We could be in the second inning. And more technology, 
narrower bid offer spreads, more penny quoting, will only make that growth grow more rapidly. And I suspect that algorithmic trading and other mechanisms in order to discover where is the liquidity to handle an institutional sized order is going to be the more interesting part of our growth for the next uh, two, three, four years. In conjunction with this study, I know the OIC is making a renewed push into probably what has been one of the most difficult areas for the options market to penetrate, which is financial advisors. For whatever reason, they seem to have little interest or little desire or they're terrified or little education. So they haven't adopted it in any way, shape or form in the numbers that they should have. The initiative is still early for you, but how is that going? I believe you're even launching a new portal just for financial advisors. No, right? We are going to do that. We've tried to begin the focus of financial advisors, but I think there was a recognition that this is a very important segment and we need to understand what their needs are and why they're reticent. So uh, we engaged a consultant to do an in-depth analysis for us to help us focus on a three-phase strategy that was just brought to our management group at our own meeting a few days ago. And we're now embarking on a more systematic method of providing a portal that is not retail in its flavor, maybe not institutional in its flavor. Financial advisors have different needs. They have time constraints. We're talking about one guy who may be reaching out and touching 100 clients regularly and 300 clients over the course of a month or two. He needs to be able to get focused information when he needs it. And we have to find a better way to provide education. The exchanges have to provide better ways to centralize data. And of course, the firms themselves need to buy into that. And we're trying to have a more um, systematic approach to providing that education. And I expect that that'll be our focus over the next 12 to 18 months, renewing our effort to provide them with what they need when they need it. I wish you luck with that because I know just from experience that that is a very difficult nut to crack. You know, there are some very smart financial advisors who are laboring, maybe somewhat more anonymously, who are garnering a great deal of business because they've distinguished themselves from their peers. Their peers are what they consider to be asset allocators. It's an easier way. You can then get scale if you're an asset allocator, get a diversified portfolio. And I'm not saying that isn't a good strategy, but there are some really smart people who have said, you know what, that's not enough. There are ways for us to get extra income by writing calls. There are ways for us to write puts to get a better entry price in buying our interests. They don't get enough publicity. One of the strategies that I hope we use is to highlight some of these, get a poster child of a financial advisor who has in fact shown success, Hmm. shown how he has been able to distinguish himself, gone beyond the average analysis and done more. I suspect that it'll be eye-opening to that community as well. It's not that they don't want to. It does take time. It does take education. It's hard to sell something if you're not fully conversant with the aspects of what can go wrong and what can go right. We can't deny that every option strategy has times when it works well and times when it works not quite as well. And they shouldn't be surprised about that. And we'll try to help them get that education and you'll try to get that word out to them. I know. We do what we can. It is always surprising to me whenever I look through our user data, our emails and our forum posts and whatnot, just how few advisors there are in the community still. You have to reach out and almost pull them into the fold, it seems. Yeah, it's true. It is true. <laughs> Kicking and screaming sometimes. I know the institutional effort, and you're essentially the face of the OIC institutional effort, is still a relatively new push for OIC. And I'm curious, you have the website now. How has it been going for the last year or two? You have a lot of traffic on there, a lot of interest overall in in the whole institutional effort? We pushed a a rock up to the top of the mountain, and it's beginning to roll downhill. You get studies like this that are timely. I mean, let's be honest, the market conditions couldn't be better for pointing out a strategy that might help give you some comfort on the downside while still participating on possible upside moves. I didn't know better. I would say you'd have timed this perfectly. Put out the study. Well, you know, I I was also concerned about the markets a year ago, and and the lead time to get a study is about a year. So you get lucky on that. But when you have more to offer that's timely, you get more interest. People look for speakers to come and address those issues. They look for information on a website. And we've sort of ridden a crest that a lot of people have brought together, even if I'm sort of the one face for the moment for the industry council. There's a lot of people that are moving it forward, and we're, we're pleased with it. 
That's about all I have, Phil, unless there's something you'd like to add. I don't. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you and your listeners again, and would love to come back again in the future. We'll have you on as, as many times as you want to come by. Whenever you have interesting studies like this, we always love to have you on. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. And that's going to do it for my conversation with Phil Gaki from the OIC. Be sure to stay tuned to www.theoptionsinsider.com for more of my interviews from the Options Industry Conference in Las Vegas. While you're there, be sure to register for our discussion center and sign up for our monthly email newsletter. If you're one of the growing number of Twitter fans out there, then be sure to follow us at twitter.com options. And you can have links to selected content and headlines from our website delivered directly to your cell phone or wherever you get your Twitter alerts. Thanks again for listening. My name is Mark Longo, and I'll see you next time on Options Insider Radio. Options Insider Radio was created by Mark Longo and produced by Gene Crotty. Options Insider Radio is a production of the Options Insider Incorporated, all rights reserved. <laughs>